Hi, so I'm Betsy Evans. I'm a graduate student at Florida Atlantic University, so that's over in Boca Raton. And my major advisor is Dale Goblick. So our lab mostly focuses on wading birds in the Everglades. Um, so my project was a little different because it brought into this urban aspect that Serge was just talking about. So what I'm going to talk to you today is on the dietary shifts of the wood storks in response to this human-induced landscape change. Um, so this opening slide shows you a photo that we just took this month on an aerial survey. Um, and this is pretty common. So you can see this two storks right there um, foraging in this canal along the roadway up by Lake Okeechobee. So that's kind of what we're looking at are these roadway features. So the first thing I want to talk about is kind of the dynamics of Everglades hydrology and how important that is for wading bird foraging. Um, so as many of you know, we have a wet and a dry season. The wet season from June to November and the dry season from December to May. Um, so wading birds really depend on this. We need a wet season that produces a lot of rainfall in order to produce a lot of prey, fish for the wading birds. And then we need a very dry, dry season in order for that prey to become concentrated in these pools. So that makes the prey very vulnerable to capture. Um, so in this bottom photograph, you can see tons of white winging birds foraging in these concentrated pools. This year, probably not gonna happen like that, but we'll see with all the rainfall. Um, and as many of you know as well, we've really altered the Everglades. So historically, the Everglades would flow from the Kissimmee River Basin down to Lake Okeechobee, which would often overflow and then go down into the Florida Bay. Um, today we have this very altered hydrology. Um, there's over 1,400 miles of canals, levees, and dikes in South Florida now. Um, and so as you can imagine, this affected the wading birds significantly. So from the 1930s, there's been a 70% decline in wading birds. Um, so what I'm focused on is the wood stork, you know, partially because it isn't endangered or was endangered up until 2014. Um, so in the 1970s, we started seeing our first collapse of the coastal wood stork colonies. And, and the hydrology during the 1970s was characteristically very dry, um, so that was part of it as well. Um, so in 1976, John Ogden did the first diet study on the wood stork. And what he found was that wood storks had a high frequency of flagfish, sailfin molly, and marsh killifish in their diet. So these are marsh fish, but the larger of the marsh fish. So those are just some photos of what those look like on the bottom. Um, but he still saw that overall they were selecting for these larger body fish like the native sunfish. Um, so again, part of the reason he probably saw such a high frequency of large marsh fish was because the hydrologic conditions were so dry. So it was very atypical. Um, and so other things that were going on in the 70s were there really weren't any exotic fish yet. So we didn't have the cichlids, the African jewel fish. And then also these anthropogenic water features, the canals, um, weren't really well established yet. They were just starting to show up. So this brings me to today and what we've been doing in our lab. So we conducted the first diet study on the wood stork since the 1976 study. So it's been a long time since somebody looked at this. And how we do this is we go into the wood stork colonies and collect the food boluses from the chicks. So that's a stomach regurgitation. So wading birds voluntarily will be super easy to identify. And what we started seeing starting in 2013 when we began sampling wood storks was that they're starting to select for a larger prey. Um, so you can see that in the dash line is our study from 2013 and 2014, and then the solid line is John Ogden's study from 1976. So we're starting to see a higher frequency of fish greater than six centimeters. And a lot of other things have changed. So recently the wood stork was downlisted and threatened because the population numbers are starting to increase. They're spreading into the Carolinas and Georgia. And then we're starting to see exotic fish very frequently in this altered landscape. Um, as well as these canals, stormwater ponds that we're just talking about are everywhere. Um, so along with that, we also saw now this present of exotic fish in their food boluses. African jewelfish, very common in a food bolus from a wood stork, um, along with Mayan cichlid, spotted tilapia, those species. So we're seeing not only a selection for larger prey, but now these exotic fish species as well, as well which are large body. Um, so something that we were interested in our lab was really comparing fish density in the Everglades, so those small marsh fish, um, to wading bird nest effort. So nest effort meaning how many nests are initiated. Um, so you can see, it's kind of difficult, but this is a regression, and 
The upper or the bottom right is small herons, so they're highly correlated, small heron nest effort with the density of these large marsh fishes, so greater than 1.9 centimeters. But when you run that same test on the wood storks, you don't see any kind of correlation. So kind of meaning that the wood storks really aren't relying on these little marsh fish in the Everglades, which I think we could all assume because they're a large body bird. They probably need a little bit more biomass than that. So what we're trying to decide is, okay, we know from the food bowls is that they're eating these very large sunfish, but we're not finding them in the Everglades. So there's been many studies done in our lab um, for 10 years on fish density, Trexler's lab at FIU. We really have a good understanding of what type of fish are in the Everglades, and on average, they're 1.9 centimeters, so small little guys like mosquito fish, killifish. Um, but with the Woodstar food bolus, we're seeing these very large bodied fish um, right around five and a half centimeters on average. So logically, we're like, where are they going to be finding these fish? And so that kind of brings me to my project. So this is funded by the Florida Department of Transportation, and it focuses on these roadway feature sites. Um, so I sample canals. Uh, these wet and dry stormwater ponds, so wet stormwater ponds being inundated all year round, uh, much like what Serge was talking about, and then these drier ponds that are dry during typically the dry season, as well as the ditches you find along the roadway. And I sample these sites each month, and we've been doing it since June of 2014, so it'll be a full 24-month um, sampling period. And we also sample them across three landscape cover types. So we look in the urban areas, so you can see there's sites um, along the east coast of Florida as well as in the Naples area. And then we're also looking at sites in herbaceous marsh, so that's like the roadway along Alligator Alley. Um, and forested marsh, again along Alligator Alley, but in that big cypress area. So we have a total of 36 sites located all across South Florida. And typically we use minnow traps, canals, and the water stormwater ponds, because there's not really a good way to, to get to the center of those ponds with trapping. And then with these driver features, we use a one meter square throw trap, which is pretty typical of Everglades fish sampling. In addition to this, I kind of already mentioned this, but we have a 10-year study in our lab where we've been doing throw trapping in the Everglades. Um, so we sample all the way across the Everglades landscape. Um, we call them primary sampling units, and we do multiple throw traps in each of those during the dry season. And so this is just an example of a throw trap. Essentially, it's a one meter square box, and you run a seine with a partner right along through it to catch the prey. So this is kind of what we're seeing. So this is a NMDS plot, which is a non-metric multiple dimensional scaling. So it doesn't have any um, labeling on the axes because it's not metric. But really what this shows you is there's distinct groupings. Um, so you can see the green circles are natural marsh sites kind of all grouped together in their similarity. Um, the blue squares are my canals and wet stormwater ponds, again, all grouped together in similarity. And then the gold stars are the drier storm, are the drier roadway features like your swales, and stormwater ponds that may not be wet year-round. And so you can run a test in the statistical package called an ANASIM that will tell you if there is a statistical difference. And based on that, we had a value that said, yes, there is a difference between all of these sites. <coughs> um, and what's driving those differences, you can find out as well. So typically, our marsh sites have killifish, our drier roadway features have tadpoles, and that's kind of what makes them different from the other sites. So with that, we wanted to kind of know what was driving these differences between the natural marsh and the roadway features. Um, so when you look at just the small body fish, so the mosquito fish, the killifish fish that you think of in the marsh, um, you can see the purple circles indicate there's a lot of those fish in these natural marsh sites. While in the roadway features, you can see not so many of those purple bubbles. So they're more, um, less common in the roadway features. On the flip side of that, you can look at the large body fish. So these are the fish that we know the wood storks are eating. Um, native sunfish, exotic cichlids, those types of species. And so you can see while they're present in the natural marsh, they're fairly rare. So it's kind of confirming what we knew with our 10-year study that, yes, these sunfish occur in the Everglades, but it's really rare to find them. Um, and as you can see in those wetter roadway features, the canals, stormwater ponds, these large body fish are much more common. And then I also wanted to look at natives and exotics, and I think this is exactly what you would probably expect. Natural marsh has tons of native fish, roadway features a few. And then when you look on the flip side of that with the exotics, you can see the exotics are mostly located in those canals and wet stormwater ponds, which I think anybody who's kind of fished in those areas would know you tend to catch the exotic cichlids. And so those are spotted tilapia, um, mine cichlid, African jewel fish, those types of species, which we are seeing in the wood stork stomach regurgitations. 
And so after we kind of figured out what was going on in these roadway features, the natural marsh, we know what the prey base is there. Um, what are the wood storks eating? Um, so as I mentioned, we collect the stomach boluses from these colonies. We have two national colonies that are located in Everglades National Park. Tamiami West, which the nest trees there are primarily pond apple. Um, it's located along Tamiami Trail right off the roadway. Probably drive by it, never even noticed it. Um, which is a pretty large colony. And then Perotus Pond, which I'm sure if you guys have visited the park, you've driven by during the nesting season where you can see the birds. And the nest trees are primarily mangrove. In addition to that, last year I became really interested more in this urban aspect of the wood stork. And in South Florida, there's quite a few of these little kind of pop-up urban colonies. Um, so I began sampling there as well. So there's one in the Ballon Isle communities, which is a very rich community. The like Williams sisters live there, the tennis players. Um, so these wood storks are like nesting like feet from their house um, on this little island in a golf course pond that, like Serge was talking about, has no vegetation. It's very clear. Um, exactly what people want. And then we have this one um, we call the Sawgrass Colony, located right off the Sawgrass Expressway, which is a major road in South Florida, right behind a car dealership. You can see it from the car dealership. And then the Griffin Road Colony, which again is located right off I-75 in Griffin Road, but it's more in like a little residential park. Um, but all of these colonies are on little islands in these stormwater ponds. So looking at that, I kind of wanted to compare all of our wood stork boluses together to what we're finding in these features. Um, so you can see, though not as great as I would have liked it to be, there is a slight overlap with wood stork boluses and canals and stormwater ponds. Um, really no overlap with the natural marsh sites. Kind of telling us, that, yeah, we know natural marsh doesn't have these really big fish, probably getting them from somewhere else. Um, again, looking at large body versus small body prey. This shows you that wood storks select for really large fish because they're a large bird, they have a lot of chicks to feed, they need a lot of biomass. And there is some overlap again with the wet stormwater features. And then exotic prey. Obviously, they eat a lot of exotic prey, especially African jewelfish. Probably getting those from the canals and stormwater ponds as well. And then here's kind of just my look, first looks. We've only had one year of data on the urban colonies. At looking at the differences between urban and natural colonies, what this shows you, there really isn't. Um, so we hope that maybe with another year of data, something will parse out with that. But there is a kind of neat difference between these urban and natural colonies. So we know they're selecting for large body prey, and if you look at the two colonies, there's two different species that are driving that difference. Um, typically in these urban colonies, they're selecting for warmouth, and in the natural colonies, they're selecting for a spotted sunfish. So both native sunfish, but there is a difference there between the two types of colonies and what they're selecting for. And so then I was kind of curious, where do we find these warmouth and spotted sunfish in our fish sampling sites? And you can kind of see warmouth much more common in those wet roadway features, spotted sunfish, not so much, but you do find those in the natural marsh. So preliminary, maybe we can say that they're probably getting those warmouth from the roadways, the urban birds. And this is just kind of a neat little thing we found, or maybe not neat, um, with our wood stork boluses this past year. So this is a typical wood stork bolus. Like I said, whole fish, very easy to identify. We have native sunfish, warmouth in there. Um, and as we began sampling those urban colonies, we started seeing some different things. So I had a hot dog that one chick had been fed, chicken wings, and bread. So there's definitely an issue in South Florida, not so much Southwest Florida, but I, if you've ever seen people feeding wood storks, pretty common with the white ibis. And then also people have seen them at landfills, so they could be getting it from there. But they fed their chicks this food, so a new food source. To kind of wrap this all up, so what we do know about the wood stork so far with this urban landscape, we know that the number of wood stork nests isn't correlated um, with the small marsh fishes in the Everglades like it is for the small herons, so the tricolors and the snowies. We know large body fish are characteristics of long hydro period areas, um, and this rarely experiences a dry down. So even though you can find those fish there, the wood storks are never gonna really get those in concentrated foods. Um, we obviously know humans have altered the South Florida landscape. We have tons of stormwater ponds and canals. And what we did find is that large bodied and exotic fish are characteristics of roadways and are found in wood stork boluses. And in addition, we're starting to see a little bit of a difference between these urban birds and natural birds in what they're selecting for for large body prey. And so just going forward, something that I wasn't able to present on is we are looking at what features or roadway corridors may attract or um, storks may avoid. Um, so that's with our aerial surveys where we take coordinates of wood storks as well as anything about the feature, the slope, the vegetation. 
And so this information will hopefully be used um, to refine the mitigation and suitable biomass calculations for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And that's definitely what the DOT is interested in. And then also trying to see if urban colonies are maybe more resilient than natural colonies. And what sparked this is last year we had a severe water reversal in, right in the middle of nesting season in April. And we saw two-thirds of our wood stork nests collapse in the Everglades colonies. And there really was no collapse in the urban colonies. Maybe suggesting that these urban birds aren't relying on that traditional Everglades hydrology, um, like the natural marsh ones are. And that's it. that are just fed small fish will regurgitate small fish? Is there any yes. differentiation in the regurgitation of the bigger So she wanted to know if wood storks that are fed small fish will regurgitate um, as readily as the ones that are fed large fish. And I do have quite a few boluses that are only like mosquito fish and sailfin and mollies. So there definitely are sometimes selecting for it, just not as much. So they, it's actually easy for them to regurgitate those versus the sunfish have the spines. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, I know this is a silly question because I asked Jason last year and he told me it was silly, but I think if you keep asking the silly questions, they stop getting silly. Um, if they're feeding on the ditches, if the uh, wood storks have problems when we get these you know, unusual years, if unusual years are going to become more usual, is there any possibility on a landscape scale that we might manipulate roadside ditch um, depths and so that with pumps and control structures move water around to create good feed? Sure. So what he's asking is if we can manipulate these roadway features in a way that would make them better for the storks. And that's exactly what we're trying to find out for the DOT. So what we can recommend to the DOT is, hey, these canals with this type of vegetation um, and this slope, slope weather, you know, steep, moderate, is better for the storks. And then in the future, they're going to start building roadways in that way. And that also allows them to mitigate less habitat. Because they can say, hey, we're actually creating this good habitat for the storks. Is there any concern about water quality in ditches? I mean, whether it's heavy metals or contaminants? Or sure. Hmm. So he's asking about if we're concerned about the water quality where these storks are getting their prey. And I think that's it. After listening to Serge's talk, definitely a concern, but that's something we can't necessarily look into with the DOT's funding. Um, they don't really want us to be like, hey, your canals are really bad. Um, but that's, I think that's a logical next step for somebody really to see, like, test the prey we're collecting. And one thing we are doing in the lab is we are going to test our bullet samples from the natural colonies on mercury. Um, but we haven't decided if we're doing the urban ones yet. But it would be interesting to compare the two. Can we do one more question? I'd like to understand a little better your plot. Can you just go through that one more time? One of them? Slowly. Here. Here. Let me just go back to one of them. <coughs> I don't understand what you plot in order to generate It's pretty paper. cool. So this is a primer. It's called primer software. Um, so they call it a non-metric, multi-dimensional scaling. So there's no axes. So it's all about the distance. Um, so these, so the natural marsh here being clumped and further from the wood stork bolus clump tells you there's more dissimilarity, more of a difference because they're further apart. So it's just about the, dif the, the distance between the groupings. And that's it. So what I actually plotted was what the, the fish species. And then it creates this similarity matrix and then pumps us out. Um, in this primer software, which is really common for people in community ecology to use. I um, mean, it's super, what's nice about it is it's really easy to use. It's all point and click and it tells you what to do the whole way. So it's a nice way and it's very good. Okay. No, I'll, continue. I'll be here. Yeah. So if you have any more questions for Betsy, she'll be sticking around. So thanks. Thank you.